Hello, this is Significant Brothers. I'm Cray. I'm Chase. And I'm Brad. And today we are talking about utensil etiquette. I'm going to start this off with a question. You have a stake in front of you, a knife, and a fork. How do you go about attacking the stake? So, what I would do in this situation is I would sit there patiently waiting for the stake to let its guard down. And then when it's not looking or it's in bed with its nice steak wife, I would attack, go right for the flesh and cut it with the knife in my right hand and the fork in my left. And then how would you convey the food to your mouth? Well, I would use the fork. Oh, oh, I know what this is. It's a simple know. question. I, like, I, I know, but it's like, usually, usually I keep the fork in my left hand. Sometimes I'll, I'll do the switch thing, but usually the fork stays in my left hand. I would bait it. I would bait it. Okay, guys. <laughs> Just <laughs> answer this like a normal person. <laughs> I would befriend it as well. Maybe, oh. maybe take it on a date and let it order a steak itself, <laughs> and then when it has its guard down. Okay, I hate you guys. Um, I, I I think saying how do you attack this is a is a poor choice of words. Okay. Right? What I consistently do is I have the fork in my left, the knife in my right. I will cut it, and then I will convey the food to my mouth with the same left hand that held the piece of steak down. What I do is I have the fork in my right hand and the knife in my left, and then I cut it. I switch over to my left hand with the fork, and then I raise it to my mouth, and then I eat it. So the style that you do, Chase, is called the American style, or the zigzag style, or the star-spangled fork over, or I just get it. What? <laughs> no, it's not a thing. <laughs> um... <laughs> So the American style is pretty unique to the United States in which you will have the fork in your left, always your left, the knife in your right, and you will cut it and then switch over to your other hand and then put it into your mouth. Whereas the European style, which I think is how I eat, is that you have the fork in your left hand, the knife in your right hand, and then you just eat with your left. So, they start off the exact same way, just one has to switch and one does not. But in the European style, you have to convey the food to your mouth with the tines of the fork down. You know what tines are? Like, the, uh, the, I'm gonna assume they're the pointy parts. The yeah, prongs, it's like, maybe? you know, yeah, like the prongs. The prongs of the fork are facing down instead of facing up. So, huh. that's actually quite difficult if you want to shovel food onto your fork. You can't really do it if it's European style. Ugh. I guess Americans would use the shovel method, wouldn't we? Some of us yeah. use a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly enough, the way Americans eat, or traditionally eat, is kind of inefficient. Because it takes you longer to cut that piece of steak, switch it over to your right hand, and then put it in your mouth. Like, don't you think that sounds, like, un-American? I feel like the American way would be to just shovel that into your mouth as fast as humanly possible. Yeah, I think inefficient, yes. Uh, but I feel like it's kind of like one of the really weird, like, traditions that we have kept. And we, I feel like a lot of Americans, we don't have a ton of traditions because we aren't a very old country. And things kind of got lost over with traveling over and just kind of having one thing that we have kept. It's kind of cool. Inefficient, yes, but it's it's neat. It is, it is weird, but you're using your dominant hand the entire time, so it might feel less funny. I don't know. Eventually, you would get used to the European way of doing it, though, if that's the way you grew up. So, inefficient, yes. We're probably used to it, though. Well, the American style actually came out of Europe, I think, when this is how Europeans used to eat in, like, the 17th century, I think, when utensils were being implemented. Eventually, they abandoned this method, but the U.S. picked it up in about the 19th century from France, because we associated that with being classy. And I think the logic behind uh, the American style is that if you switch it over to your dominant hand, which is usually the right hand, not for me and Chase, uh, we can't, Chase can't truly do it, he's inhibited by his left-handedness, uh, that barbarian <laughs> I... over there, <laughs> that it's more delicate, and I think 
highbrow to convey food to your mouth with your right hand because it's your dominant hand and you can more easily do it which is why you do it because chase you're left-handed and you can you feel more confident getting that food into your mouth with your left hand it's about a 99 percent chance but if you switch it to your right that reduces it by a good 20 percent if i switch it if i switch it to my right i just better be hoping i'm not wearing a white shirt (laughs) Also, uh, another theory is that that in part of the zigzag style, the American style, is that you put your knife down while you're holding your fork in your other hand. is kind of a symbol of trust that you know you're not gonna use this knife on anyone at the dinner um, because around when these utensils are being implemented, uh, I guess people are just barbarians back then. Because <laughs> when you set it down, the the blade is supposed to be facing in towards you, not yep. towards the other guests. And I guess the other the other way you could do it is that you just switch the knife and the fork in the hand, you're always holding the knife, but in the true American style, you put it down at the top of your blade, blade facing towards yourself. And, uh, I was reading Etiquette for Dummies, and I was thinking, well, what about us left-handers who, uh, want to eat the other way, like Chase does? And it says, I quote, at no time should you hold your utensils in any other fashion. It doesn't matter if you're <laughs> left-handed. <laughs> oh, so that's a shout-out to Chase. You know, I was reading the same thing for a chainsaw manual. <laughs> They're just like, no, it's tough <laughs> <laughs> um, But, g- g- I mean, going to the whole, like, proper holding left hand and right hand, that's, that's, it's, it's kind of, that just goes back to older, like, way back in the day, because obviously what you would do majority of people are right-handed and so what you do is that you'd usually shake you'd exchange money you would eat with your right hand because you used your left hand to wipe your butts or do all the dirty work with that's still i'm sure that carries over to some utensil use today but even when i was in zambia um all of your eating was done with your right hand scooping rolling rice like things it was all done with your right hand and it was very very rude to eat anything with your left hand well, that is that is all I have on American slash European slash continental style. So, guys, you uh, you consider uh, America and Europe to be decently similar culturally, right? Absolutely. Yes. And we group each other together, and we have a very similar style of how we eat our food with our utensils. Now, imagine Asia, which is a very large place, specifically Southeast Asia, and while they all use the same kind of materials, the rules for eating are quite a bit different from each other. So I guess kind of similar is like, the countries that are closer together are the ones that have the most similarities. Um, like China and Vietnam share a lot more similarities than what China and South Korea do. Namely because South Korea is separated by another country to China, and also that uh, it's denser, it's more densely populated in the South, so a lot more of the cultures are going to be similar between the two more densely populated areas. Look, in China and Vietnam, it's very much you use, you lift the bowl up and you use the chopsticks to get the rice from the bowl into your mouth. But if you were to do that in Korea, even lifting the bowl up at all is rude. In Korea, you would bring your face down towards the bowl and you could help get the rice into your mouth that way. So a lot of a lot of similarities like that, even differences in chopsticks. Japan has shorter, more square chopsticks than what China does, which are longer and more round. Yeah, and once you get done eating, what are you gonna do with those chopsticks? I believe- You're not gonna cross them. You're not gonna cross them. And I believe one thing that's just a no-no is you take the chopsticks and you set them vertically in the bowl. That is, uh, it's supposed to, or it's not supposed to, but it happens to look like um, the twin incense sticks that they use for funerals. So that's actually, uh, that is a no-no. And you pl- what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to like place them across the plate or... Um, uh, like on like across the bowl so that they're like that you're not supposed to set them to the side is that right brad yeah um well i know in south korea it's really rude to put them parallel to each other on your bowl um that's 
similar to like setting them upright in other ones, setting them horizontally in South Korea is offensive. So they can't cross, they can't be vertical. I think you just put them on your bowl. But I know in all of these cultures, or in all these countries, it is offensive to let the food portion of your chopsticks touch. Like, you don't let the food ends touch the table. If you don't have a stand to do it, you either use your bowl or you make one out of a napkin and you never ever pick up your food with the non-food ends of the chopsticks. Oh, that makes sense. I, it's also like just playing with your chopsticks, kind of rude. What's interesting is in Thailand, they don't use chopsticks as much as you'd think. They mostly use forks and spoons. Um, they use the fork which is a Western sort of thing to push the food onto the spoon. And yes. So the, the reason that they, they occasionally use chopsticks is because the Chinese brought over to them noodles and what they ate uh, the noodles with is chopsticks. So only when they are eating some sort of noodle will they use chopsticks. But they also are big into sharing plates. So if you order a plate of food, expect to share it with everybody at the table. When the noodles came over, so did the chopsticks. And when the idea of sharing food came over, brought over by the Chinese, they also were trying to spread the idea of communism, we can assume. Uh, oh, you know, what's, you know what's also interesting is um, uh, they use, like I said, in Thailand, they mostly use uh, forks and spoons, but they don't use the fork the same way we do. They mostly use spoons for like everything. So if you have a meatball on your plate and they don't, they normally have smaller like helpings of food so you don't need to cut stuff but if you had a meatball on your plate you'd hold down with your left hand the fork with the skewer and then you take the meatball and you would cut it with the spoon and then you'd scoop it into your mouth that way they also obviously eat rice mostly if it's not very sticky rice they mostly eat it with a, a spoon but uh malaysian people mostly use their hands to eat food and they do the whole thing. Obviously, you scoop with your right hand uh, as opposed to your left because of wiping. Uh, but uh, the, the cultures that you use chopsticks the most are mostly Japan and China. And what's cool, not cool, this is actually bad. Um, <laughs> Japanese people were the first people to create wooden chopsticks in the late 19th century. And now every year, they cut down, uh, as a world, we cut down 25 million fully grown trees just to fuel this industry of disposable chopsticks, the wooden ones. Wow. Yeah. And I think 80% of the wooden chopsticks in Japan come from a town called Obama. But the uh, there's actually a big market of, I mean, in, in households, everyone has their own set of chopsticks. You There's not just a big drawer that has, you know, like we would have all of our spoons and forks. They have just their own set of chopsticks. So you'd have like metallic ones that everyone uses. And there's a big market of Pokemon ones in Japan. Kids have like their little Pokemon chopsticks. I assume some adults do too. So that's kind of fun. I, I kind of want a pair. Yeah, you can buy them on Amazon for like 13 bucks. <sighs> do I want to spend $13 on something I'll use once or twice a year? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, well, you know how elephant poaching is a big thing tens of thousands are killed each year for their ivory uh, most of it I believe goes to Asian markets and they will be fashioned into certain items and one of those is chopsticks and they can go for about I want to say about a thousand dollars but that sounds it almost sounds low for how valuable ivory is I wonder how many but chopsticks yeah. you could make out of one elephant uh <laughs> That's kind of like, uh, how many licks does it take to get to the center of the cup? <laughs> <laughs> Except that's terrible, because poaching is a real problem. Don't poach, guys. I poached my eggs. Yeah, only poach your eggs. Don't poach elephant tusks. Uh, there's another thing with drinking tea. If there's one person who's serving tea around a table, uh, what people will do is when they get served their tea they will tap two fingers on the table to say thank you it's to symbolize your two knees 
uh, is a gesture of deference. In my mind, when they do like the two taps on the table, it just reminds me of like a like a baseball coach signaling someone to steal like first base. They're like tapping their fingers and swiping their sleeves and then slapping their face. I don't know what they do to signal stealing a base, but in, in my mind, that's what I saw it as. Uh, I don't know. That kind of reminds me of uh, playing euchre. Yeah. Yeah. Pass. It's also in uh, East Asian culture. It's common to invite over people that you don't know that well for dinner maybe even strangers but you invite them over for dinner and it's actually kind of rude to not accept so it's advised to accept and it's even better if you stay until they ask you to leave or even beg you to leave or even call the police <laughs> <laughs> If everyone out there finds our content at least half as interesting as we do, you can follow us on Twitter at Significant Bros. And if you want to stay up to date on our significant happenings, you can go to tinyletter.com slash significant brothers. You can sign up for our newsletter, which includes our show notes. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>